Good morning. Hello. Greetings. Good day. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, I guess we'll just give people a couple of minutes. Liz, we will likely have time for open floor today. We will likely have time for what, sorry? Uh, open floor, just basically questions okay. and things. So um, just kind of keep that in mind as far as like, the things that we currently have on the agenda are not likely to take the full hour. Okay. All right, have we got, well, 24 is actually pretty, pretty much a good turnout for us these days. We got, uh, we got good representation from the TOC, Amy. Uh, we're getting there. A few more people rolling on in, but we don't need quorum for this particular uh, meeting today. So I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. Maybe we can get started. So uh, welcome, everyone. Normal things normal behavior and uh, yeah, so uh, as Amy mentioned, we'll probably have time for some open floor, but uh, we thought we could have a look at uh, the current set of projects that are applying for graduation and incubation and just try and get a, a, a read and, and discuss maybe some feedback for those projects. Um, I don't know if we have this on the slides, but um, I'm sure a lot of people will be aware we've been talking about uh, and there is a PR I'm sure someone can find the PR for um, streamlining the graduation process such that we will um, when a project applies for graduation we'll try and have a, a, a quick uh, discussion in the TOC just to sort of get a read on whether there are any uh, well it, it, either sponsors who are very keen to take that project through graduation or possibly if there are concerns that people have that basically say we you know we we know we're going to struggle to vote in favor of graduation because of concern x y z so that proposal is out there we haven't had a vote on it yet but there's no reason why we couldn't start having those kind of discussions you know now anyway the the process is about kind of uh, formalizing something that we we believe we should be doing anyway amy has posted that pr thank you amy all right so i guess the projects that we have on deck for graduation i think 
Nats has been there for a long time. GRPC has been there for a while. Falco has been there for a while. Um, not so long, actually. Falco's uh, a more recent application. Um, and we could probably just have a discussion about the status of those projects and, and see whether or not we have a TOC member forthcoming who wants to sponsor them or whether we have any particular feedback for those projects um, at this stage. And I think, you know, it's useful to get input from the wider TOC community as well. Um, for both incubation and graduation, we do need a sponsor to step forward if it's going to, if the process is going to go ahead. So if there is an absence of TOC sponsor, that basically says the, the project is not going to get through that next stage. But we think it would be helpful if we can articulate feedback to the projects about you know, why people are not feeling confident to step forward. Does that make sense? Any questions or comments about that right now? Okay. Do we, are we also um, soliciting at all the, the tags prior to that? I think if there is, yeah, I, I think the way that we um, described it in that um, PR, it doesn't affect what we would do with tags at all. This is supposed to be more of a shortcut process to say, you know, if there's some, if the TOC, if there's someone who's really keen to sponsor a project, they can step forward earlier in the process and make themselves known earlier. And equally, if there are people who have serious reservations, we can make that known earlier in the process. Those reservations might turn out to be unfounded or wrong, you know, but that could be input into what the, um, what the, what we ask the tags to look into, or, um, you know, if, if we, if we were to say, you know, particular project we don't believe is ready for graduation, that project would be able to come back quickly and say, actually, we'd like to discuss this because we think you're wrong for, for whatever reasons. That seems, you know, I, th I think that's better than our current limbo situation, but I don't think it actually changes. It's more about forcing us to have a conversation earlier rather than changing anything about how the tax involvement fits into the sort of- Yeah. I yeah. I just wondered if the tags, if they had serious reservations, like I don't know that every TOC we've had has fully represented the spectrum of technology that is the umbrella, right, of the CNCF. And so I just did wondered if, if we also have that kind of gut check with the tags, if they had like, there are more boots on the ground, understand maybe some of the interactions that they would be able to, at that point, if they had serious I guess I'm more in that if they had serious reservations, they could also bring that up at that point. Definitely. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. I, I think this this early stage isn't supposed to be about like making a like it's not about deciding whether things go into graduation or incubation. It's more about deciding, okay, how are we going to go through this process? Are there some immediate things we want to get investigated or get dealt with? you know if we have um you know blocking issues it might be better to tell the project kind of straight away rather than saying yeah okay after six months of deliberation we've decided that this thing we already knew was going to be an issue so right i was just honestly thinking of like open EBS as an example like maybe that was well known in the what would have been the six then and the tax now and not necessarily to the toc unless it had been brought up through that process. So I just wondered if we wanted to formalize that, you know, touching. Yeah, I mean, I think they would that. still be able to bring up those concerns. You know, it doesn't change the due diligence process in either case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, is, is that, does that make sense to, yeah. Yep. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments about the sort of general principle of that process change. All right. So um, this was admittedly quite a late breaking um, choice to, to discuss these on the agenda today. So um, 
uh, appreciate this is um, we haven't had a lot of chance to to go and research the projects, but let's air the things that we know and um, and see where that takes us. So Nats have been applying for graduation for a very long time, and we have historically had concerns about the um, the kind of vendor independence of Nats. Um, the last we discussed it to my recollection, there was a, um, a suggestion that perhaps going along the lines of an advisory group, uh, a bit like Linkerd have, have put in place might be a way forward, but I don't know if Nats have actually made any progress in that direction. And if anyone is aware or would like to comment, and if we have anyone from yeah hi this is ginger collison um hi on ginger the hi. team at snadia hi um you know we've been watching the changes in the toc and um you know the different criteria and changes to graduation requirements um we had discussed putting in a steering governing committee kind of thing and at the time we were doing this and the level of effort it was going to take more discussions around the contributor strategy group and with the TOC was that that may or may not help us with graduation. So we kind of put a pause on it um, to see um, where the TOC was going to land and their graduation requirements before we move forward. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, with Linkerd going through with graduation, um, for us at Nats, it's a little disappointing, um, frankly, just because we tried and actually our diversity or contributorship or whatever, in my opinion, was greater than Linkerd's and it didn't seem, <clears throat> excuse me, that Linkerd went through the same rigorous <laughs> due diligence that the Nats team had to go through. So. Right now we're just kind of in a holding pattern to see what we're going to do next and um, what is the best way forward for us. Right, so uh, I guess we, you know, this doesn't have to be a kind of comparison of, of Linkerd and, um, uh, and Nats, you know, I don't want to kind of put them up head to head. We did, I think Linkerd have uh, it, it, actually there's a lot in common between those two projects that there's you know there's a single company um, that for which many of the maintainers work and um, I, I think actually William articulated very very well that you know the challenge that if they have a really good contributor to the project they want to hire that person and and that's good for their business so I think the fact that you know they came up with the steering committee model they worked pretty hard to try and make sure that that steering model steering committee had you know um teeth within the governance process they put the steering in com committee in place a few months you know before they came back and reapplied for graduation so that we could see that it had it, you know it wasn't just a sort of passing fad that they had actually put that in place. So I think that could be a good model for a steering committee for other projects in a similar, you know, in a similar situation like Nats is in where there's, uh, uh, you know, for good reason, one company who are tending to hire the contributors and the maintainers for, uh, for that project. Okay, and a question also. So when we applied for graduation, at that point, the tags were not doing the due diligence documentation. So to move forward, would we have to go through, um, like with Tag Network, would we go through the due diligence with them all over again? So we should be able to reuse the incubation due diligence as a starting point. Um, and the graduation due diligence is, is a much kind of, you know, it should be a smaller um, 
process. It's really up to the TOC person who sponsors graduation to decide how much they want to delegate to the TAG. Okay. And I, I don't even recall who our sponsor was at the time. It might have been Alexis, but he's no longer at the TOC. So I assume we would have to get a new sponsor. Y yes, that would be correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I, I think if there were a, because in many respects, you know, Nats is a very mature project. Um, I think if there were a good solution to the steering committee, I, I wouldn't want to stand in the way of anybody else sponsoring it. And this is very much predicated on there being some, you know, good stable steering committee solution in place. But if that were in place, I would sponsor it. Okay, good to know, thank you. Anyone else got any other comments or questions on that? Anyone else from the TSE got any opinions on Nats's readiness for graduation? I have a question. So are we saying this, this steering committee is a requirement for projects that don't have multiple organizations like as committers? Um, so we've, we've talked a few times about how we want to document this. And, and I think Josh uh, is here and, and may have um, some additional things he might want to weigh in from the, the contributor strategy governance group. I, th I think we we always ended up in a situation where we didn't want to say a steering committee is like the solution we want because we would prefer projects to have contributors from multiple organizations we think that's the better solution in many cases but we have this situation where there are projects that have you know, a very close relationship with one vendor. They, you know, they've been there, they've been part of the CNCF for many years and um, we wanna be able to support those projects in a way that doesn't, you know, that still provides the guarantees that we wanna provide, well, guarantee is a strong word, but still de-risks, you know, that the project isn't quite, it, that it isn't, um, at risk of a vendor just kind of deciding to um, uh, you know, do things like feature holdback. I, I think that's one of the, the real risks. Um, yeah, the previous TOC decided that the two, the two reasons for the multi-organization requirements, the two things that uh, the CNCF wanted to emphasize were number one, that the project is open to contributions from people working for companies other than the original sponsoring vendor. Um, and obviously, if you have a maintainer who works for a different company, that, that readily demonstrates that. Um, and the second thing uh, is that the project will survive something happening to the original vendor, um, or has at least the possibility of surviving. Obviously, lots of projects have a problem in the second, so it's more of a matter of, um, you know, how risky is that particular risk? Um, the, um, and, and, you know, when we discussed this multi-organization requirement last year, those, those were the two things we're emphasizing. So um, I think on the new graduation short form, there's a question specifically about the second. There is, yeah. Yeah, it's something, uh, maybe Dims will, oh, Dims has sent his apologies, but I, Dims might remember the wording, but yeah, it's, something like how will you ensure the longevity of your project in the event that the original founding company stops supporting it or something like that yeah i mean my question was more about whether the toc has thought about formalizing that type of process or or maybe yeah we didn't we didn't want to like write down a um, a prescriptive, like a lot of things in the CNCF and, and the TOC are sort of based on prior 
examples. Um, so we didn't want to say a steering committee like this is the solution that we would accept because maybe that wouldn't be right for all projects for which is yeah, and I think we would always be asking a project why it needed a steering committee rather than having multiple uh, organizations represented amongst the maintainers but if there are good reasons why that is the case for a project you know we should be open to kind of I think the steering committee model is a creative solution to you know addressing very much the first of those two points that Josh mentioned that the one about ensuring that the project is open to con contributions and that the roadmap isn't entirely steered for the benefit of one company. And I think the types of steering committees are also a little bit different across the projects, because if you look at the linker D steering committee, it's an end user steering committee. So it doesn't actually have, um, it doesn't have much say over the technical aspects like the Kubernetes steering committee does. So it's it's a different type of steering committee. So so we're also not necessarily specifying what type of steering committee we're talking about. So I think there are multiple types depending on the project. Yeah. Yeah, I think it also depends on the the founding organization. Maybe the the founding organization is this really. Uh, stable company too. So, I mean, would they need a steering committee? I mean, if, in the case of Kubernetes, you know, it's Google, right? So, I mean, but Google, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, like uh, Kubernetes has a lot of, uh, you know, different organizations contributing, right? So that's not, not a good example. Yeah, I mean, I think that Kubernetes is a, a really interesting sort of mental experiment that, you know, it obviously it had its roots in Google and Google is still a huge contribute to the, to the project, but if Google were to, I don't know, just suddenly decide that it was not doing anything in the world of Kubernetes, the project would have, you know, some serious gaps to fill, but I think it would still carry on. I think that's the, um, yeah, that's the, the, the sort of the level of de-risking that we're, that we would like to see. And I think it is harder for a project to demonstrate that if it doesn't have contributors from uh, or maintainers from from lots of different organizations and we do have projects with like a pretty low bus factor as well where you know there would be a serious risk to the project if a particular um uh you know particular individual yeah that they, they, they'd have yeah but, but hopefully none of the graduation projects would just not survive you know i think we we want to be in a position where the graduation projects can pick themselves up, dust themselves off after a catastrophic disaster like that. Liz, would it be uh, fair to say really this is about the longevity of projects and trying to guarantee that? I think so. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I think uh, from the TOC perspective, it's less trying to be pres prescriptive about how to do that. It's like these committees are one way to do that but it sounds like the TOC is open to uh, kind of other options as long as kind of that end goal is met. And that's why it's not a requirement per se. Yeah, I think that's, that's well articulated. I think GRPC may have some similar it, it, it feels like there's some parallels between GRPC and, and that. Do we have any GRPC maintainers here? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, April. Hi. Hey, Liz. Um, yeah, I, I have to give a big plus one to what Ginger said. Um, GRPC kind of went through a similar experience of, you know, feeling kind of like the goalposts um, requirements were, were kind of moving and changing on us. So it was kind of hard to commit to that big governance overhaul like uh, ginger was saying as well so um from the grpc perspective we're also in that weird spot where it's a library so you have the core that is heavily supported by google but you also have the net implementation that is heavily supported by microsoft and you have the swift implementation that is done by apple um so you know it's 
it's kind of hard to say that like in your example of Kubernetes, if Google were to just decide we're not going to do gRPC anymore, um, you know, there's still companies that would keep the, the project would still going, keep going. I mean, people are using this in, in production. Um, so it's just kind of this weirdness of trying to solve for whatever the, the particular maintainer requirement was um, and not really finding a way that would really change. You know, it's our, it's our opinion that we do have the maintainer diversity. Um, and, you know, I, I think also one of the things to consider when we talk about steering committees and, and everything else is like, what is the problem we're actually trying to solve? Um, there's, you know, maintainer diversity is one thing. I think we all are feeling that, especially post pandemic, a lot of projects are, you know, seeing that. Um, there's also the, you know, when you talk about the longevity issue, it, you know, it, it, there's two things. One, it's open source. So it's always, if the maintainer steps down, hopefully someone else will pick it up and run with it. And that's also, I think, why we donate to CNCF is so that there is that community of people that care about a project and would let it go. I mean, you know, keep it going. I think that's kind of the advantage of doing that. So um, that's kind of my thoughts. Um, but from GRPC's perspective, uh, we are very much, you know, engaged with the community. We have a well-documented process for putting in a new feature request. We hold ourselves to it just as much as everyone else. Um, and I said, you know, we've got great maintainer. Microsoft in particular has just done a fantastic job supporting their .NET implementation. Um, so we certainly work with others and we are very much used in production, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say, um, maybe I'm not looking in the right place. I'm just looking in GRPC, GRPC and the maintainers. Oh, there is one Dropbox maintainer. There's one, there's, oh, no, there's there are actually three. Well. There are three, there's one from Skyscanner and okay. one from somewhere else. Well, yeah, cool. and that's just core implementation. I mean, when you look at the .NET, it's pretty much all Microsoft. And, and that would um, be in a different repo, would it? Right, that's the that's the problem with gRPC is it's not just one maintainer's file, it's a maintainer's file for each language implementation. Yeah. Yeah, Nats has the same issue yep. with regard because we are an entire, you know, Oregon GitHub and we have, you know, 30 some clients that, um, you know, complement the NAT server and are required um, for the NAT server to work um, in production and all. And we have mm -hmm. contributors from um, individuals to different companies that contribute to all those different um, clients as well um, as connectors um, that are not in our necessarily our GitHub organization, but they are, um, you know, all over the community, so. Yeah, I think that's one part like, you know, with obviously Nats went for graduation before GRPC did, but we both kind of hit the same spot in the process where we are different than, you know, a, a traditional yeah. project since we are kind of that library structure. And that's where we both hit that same kind of pain point of, no, if you look at the core repo, you know, there there is largely Google maintained, of course, we're running it ourselves in production. Um, but when you look at, you know, the other repos, there, a lot of them, we don't even know, you know, <laughs> the, the Swift repo, I'm not sure what Apple's up to with it. And that's fine, you know. Going back into history, and this is an, a, an ex member of the TOC and, mm -hmm. um, you know, so who no longer, you know, has a has a binding vote, I, I recall there was a concern this is historical, so hopefully things have moved on. There was a concern that um, it, it was hard to get proposals accepted into GRPC unless you were from Google. I don't know if that's, um, um, you know, a fair concern, but that I remember being brought up. I mean, I, I would, of course, ask for an example, um, which I realize it's historical, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, but exactly. we do have and maybe the, maybe the, the the way to address that is to say, well, here are some counter examples. Here are things that have been proposed by yeah, you, sure. you know, people outside the organization. That would that would I think go a long way to addressing that 
Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's it's kind of twofold again. Of um, we do have a documented process for G A G. Um, gosh, it's too early. G R P C G R F C. Because uh, <laughs> we like our acronyms. Um, so you know, you make the proposal, you fill out the standard document. Um, kind of similar to how the TOC does. We have a two week process, you know. Um, so no, not everything is going to go through, um, but you know, we, we definitely have a well-documented process and other things have. And then that's countered by, that's one library that is, you know, particularly strict perhaps. You can counter that with, you know, when you look at, like I said, the Swift repo, the Rust repo, you know, those process, they have the same process, but, um, you know, the level of getting something in, in terms of a new feature is probably easier on some of the newer repos that don't have as much of a legacy code issue. So I think that's, you know, some of it, like if, if we keep going back to the main repo, which is the C, you know, that's got a ton of <laughs> technical debt <laughs> and other issues. Um, so it's not necessarily as easy to put in a new feature as it would be in some of the other languages. And that's not a project specific barrier. That's just that particular, you know, technical spec. The, um, the GRFC proposal website though, has a, the, the governance of this list one specific person as the approver unless someone else is assigned there doesn't seem to be a seems seems to have a um as a, as a specific named individual as the approver for all um grfcs which doesn't seem a very open process let me check at that because normally what we all of our github is set up with teams so I'm wondering if that's just a technical issue, but I will check on that. But no, it's 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 all reviewed by the same uh, maintainer list. So it could just be a. I will double check on that, but yeah, it's all and I think in the governance, there's a separate governance.md that describes the process more but uh, if we have it not properly documented on that rfc page i will update that so thank you for calling that out i feel like you know time has you know that's that's clearly a, a a thing that needs to be to be addressed but um you know that doesn't seem insurmountable mm -hmm. um i wonder whether we should be well first of all let me just see if there's anyone from the TSC here today who would be interested in sponsoring grpc through the process subject to things like this being fixed up We don't necessarily have all members anyway. But. Uh, um, I, I, I could probably do it. I, once I've finished my incubation um, runs. Great, great. Okay, so that sounds like there is appetite there to dive into this and see whether uh, we can't find a way for GRPC to sort of answer those questions about longevity and, and risk. Because I think in many other respects, it's an extremely, uh, uh, you know, widely used project. <laughs> yeah, and I guess, I mean, it feels like we're kind of coming back to, we're having, like, I, I'm not sure what more we, we need to do to address the longevity and risk. I, I mean, it, you know, every, that's the nature of open source, right? Everybody's a volunteer. So um, I can't guarantee in the future <laughs> that if we were to just suddenly stop working on grpc i can't speak for anyone else um and and guarantee it would continue on 
so I don't know if, if that's that's the piece that I feel like you know if I can speak for the Nats folks as well like we're we're feeling a little in the dark on exactly how we're supposed to solve a you know the, the longevity of an open source project like isn't that the whole reason we make them open source and donate it to a foundation maybe one way to think about this is um how would you if you had an end user company who was relying on grpc or on something else that was relying on grpc how would you articulate to them you know this is a this is something we believe you can depend on you know like you say it's open source it's not like things are set in stone and guaranteed and it's not something you pay for but you want to have some uh uh, and you don't well, have to answer this now i'm saying i think that's that's maybe a way to think about like articulating it and saying this is why we don't think it's at risk if this happened this is well, what we think would be the outcome well and that's what i think like having that requirement for graduation that it's you know used in production like well that's why i don't think it's going to go anywhere <laughs> because it's being used in production at google and netflix and you know a lot of big companies that are involved in the cncf as well um yeah. So, I mean, if I was speaking to an end user, that's what I would say. And I think that's how they've adopted it. Um, but there is, even with that, like there's always that inherent risk of open source. Like anytime you bring a dependency in, who knows? Um, I think we all recognize that when we do, when we use open source. So that's the piece that it's, we're, we're kind of constantly coming up against this. And yeah, um, and, and of course, I mean, this is, this is where the, you know, the multi-vendor thing, addresses the risk thing to some extent because it basically says you know if one company decides not to participate anymore there are other people who are still interested we think you know we and we have that you know so that, that, could, that. that could well be the you know sufficient answer to to that question uh, speaking as an end user, so for example, Kubernetes, uh, I know there is a lot of involvement from vendors like uh, VMware and Red Hat and that gives a lot of um, trust. And, this, and, and I'm talking about the technical contributions. And if in addition to project adoption by the vendors or contribution from the vendors, there would be more trust. I, and I, I hear you. And I, what I'm saying also is for, like, I, I feel like on gRPC's perspective and Nats as well, we have, we have done that. And so, yeah. we're, but we're still coming up against this and we have for years. My, my sense is, April, that, you know, time has passed. Things mm -hmm. do look very stable. There's, you know, a lot of usage of gRPC. So mm -hmm. I I don't want to prejudge anything, but I think the fact that Justin is, has volunteered to put that on his queue is, is uh, a step in the right direction towards graduation. Great. Yeah, happy to, you know... <laughs> Let's cross this off the list. Come on. Yeah. Us and Nats, yeah. let's go. I, listen, <laughs> I have, Pancakes is ready. Pancakes has a cap and gown. He is ready to go. That's our adorable <laughs> little dog mascot for GRPC. So like, he's ready. Um, yeah. Excellent. There's your incentive right there. You get a cute <laughs> sticker. So yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. All right. Uh, and then Falco, which is a, a considerably less long in the tooth application than the gRPC and Nats one. So um, um, I think I saw, is it Leo on Dan's here? So we have some folks here from Falco. Yeah, um, uh, Lo Loris here. Uh, hi, Loris. Falco, hi. One of the Falco maintainers. Um, yeah, we've definitely been in the queue less than the other projects. It's been probably at this point uh, around four months, something like that. Uh, in a general way, from our perspective, it's more like, uh, um, let's say, waiting for guidance, understanding from the TOC, what's your view? Uh, if, you, if you think we are ready, and if yes, uh, if somebody would like to sponsor us, if not, uh, we'd love to understand uh, what we can do here to to move the project in the proper direction direction to our graduation. Um, 
I guess I had put a few thoughts on the PR for this a, a few days ago. I would say at the moment, it feels to me like it's not as stable as I would like to see. I'm not saying it's unstable, but I would like to see a kind of a broader set of maintainers and contributions over time through, you know, if I, if I compare it to, if I compare it to Nats or GRPC, for example, the, the number of people and the, the, the momentum behind it has been, uh, I, I guess it just doesn't feel as established. Um, for a graduating project. How would we measure it and what would you like to see? We've seen in a general way, a uh, pretty strong adoption uh, of the project, including several uh, users using it as scale uh, in, in production. Uh, I think we documented uh, some of them in, uh, in, in our PR. In a general way at this point, uh, yes, you know, SysDig is the company that originally contributed it, but uh, the community, we feel it's pretty healthy, pretty much uh, at this point, largely on autopilot. We have uh, uh, constant uh, discussions uh, on Slack, uh, constant contributions, including uh, uh, contributions from our, uh, some of our direct competitors that are participating to, to the project. We have, uh, many companies with commercial products, uh, uh, basic, basing essentially solutions on top of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Falco. So um, what, what, can we, what can we show you? Can I kind of add yeah. to this? And sorry, Lawrence, if I can just add to this. And there's also, if you look at our adopters file, and by the way, I'm Dan Papandre, I'm the director of open source uh, community and ecosystem for Falco. Um, and so if you look at kind of the adopters file and also like, you know, if you look at the names in terms of hyperscale, you see like the AWS and Red Hats of the world. I just was late to this call because I was on a, on a call with um, Microsoft who were looking to integrate us from the, uh, from the Azure perspective, right? And so there's that. In terms of main, maintainers that are, you know, external to, to SysDig, again, it's when you're, you know, created the project, you kind of have to spare it, especially, spearhead it, especially because of the in interesting, you know, like the introspection point that we have with EBPF and those types of things. There's a limited set of, of folks that understand how to do that. We've made it very much inroads with the Falco Sidekick project, with ha which has, you know, many external contribu contributors. And so, so much, in fact, that we've created seven direct blogs that have integrations to things like Prometheus, OpenFaz, um, you know, Tecton, Argo CD, which is also a, a project looking to get graduated. So there's a lot of community um, integration and also we're seeing maintainers that are of, of a wider um, uh, a wider main, main, main maintainers base from that perspective. So we're just looking at it this like, yeah, I think we're much more established than we were during incubation, for instance. If you look at it for Docker pools, for instance, it's from 8.2 million Docker pools as of this morning to 29 million. So we know this project is being used. So we just want to understand from the talk, what is our next steps? What can we do to put the talk at ease for either one for us to get a sponsor or two for us to graduate or both so i personally i mean you know unfortunately you have the, the disadvantage that i know a little bit about this space so you know, um the psychic fabulous wonderful that you have people contributing to it but people contributing to psychic are not necessarily going to be able to maintain the ebpf code or the kernel module code if you're using that side of things um I, if I look at the contributors to the core Falco code, you know, that the, it's, it's pretty cystic dominated. We've talked before about how that doesn't have to be a blocker that can, you know, there can be ways of having steering committees to ensure that, you know, the project isn't just being driven for the benefit of that one commercial company. Um, but, you know, if I look at, again, you have the disadvantage that I know some of these people, the fact that two of the top three contributors have moved on and they may be, they're still contributing. So that's great. But I would want to see them contributing over a period of months to say that that's actually stable. 
you know, it, it's on the ebpf side again we've made inroads talking to other projects that are using ebpf if we, and, and, and as mainstay projects of this so if you look at like we've talked to like ite for instance from tracy to see if maybe there's ways we can come up with a universal rule set or contribution to like you know he asked us to look into updating a a, a, a driver kit update so we can all have a, a, a standard place there that's one in terms of you know like we talked about before and you're in the space and you understand this it's very hard to find folks that understand ebpf you know xdp all those types of things and so you know that's something that you know because we you know you know cystic has that underlying expertise it's and as i'm sure the same is, is for isovalum or or, or well, well, I, I mean right? I, i'm i'm currently doing the incubation review for Cilium and they have nine external contributors contributing to the core things. I, 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 those are people who, you know, uh, will be working with EPPF and I've been talking to end users about EPPF and, and that's not the part of it that they have problems contributing with because I asked explicitly about that because it's obviously a, an issue. So I, I actually don't think that's a, that's a, uh, an excuse for not having maintainers on the EP, on EPBF code. That's a fair statement. And again, it's it's also I think having like CNI integrations as well. I mean, is this specific to um, EBPF capabilities or just overall? No, it's more just looking at the the you know if I look at the core code, you know if I look or if I look at the core repo, knowing that. You know, I mean, I'm just looking at the graphs now. I'm going to guess that two thirds of the contributions in the last month came from people who've recently changed from Cystic to something else. I'm just doing that by eye. I don't, you know, with, you know, and that's great. It's fantastic that there could be another company supporting the, you know, the project going forward. But I wouldn't want to you know say to an end user that you know, that's it's multi-vendor it's de-risk i want to see that over a longer period of time yeah that's that's my honest opinion of it it's it, it just doesn't feel that we have an established stable group of cross you know multi-vendor um, contributors at this point And hopefully you can get there. Hopefully you can find people to contribute to to that code. And you know, if for example, um, you know, collaborating with Aqua uh, comes to pass, that would be a really good way of, you know, having a multi-vendor uh, input. But I just don't think it's there yet. What would you like? to see at this point, Try, trying to understand, you know, what the next steps for us could be and what, what, what can we do here and what can be the metrics for us to be considered worth graduating. So the, the, the criteria require the TOC to feel that is sufficiently mature, um, which is a pretty, you know, subjective measure, but that allows us to, you know, look at the maturity of different projects along a lot of different axes. I, as I say, I just have this flag right now that the core project has a small number of maintainers. Those maintainers are almost exclusively from Cystig or just left Cystig, I would want to see over a period of months some stability around that and you know a, a continued um, continued activity to to make people confident that that is a project that isn't just going to get parked. It's it's not the answer you want to hear, but that's my yeah, I, I think it just needs some time. So in practice, this means uh, uh, we 
come back again in a certain month, a month of months. And if yes, what would you recommend this amount is? I think usually when we've had situations where we've suggested people go away and come back again, it's usually been sort of six months. I mean, there could be other people in the TOC who disagree with me. I, you know, it's not just me. I feel a bit like I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> Yeah, we recommend to check in with the TOC periodically, maybe once a month or something like that, and see how the project. Uh, I, I think once a month would be pretty, um, you know, <laughs> pretty frequent for us, <laughs> yeah. given the rate of things yeah. that we get through. <laughs> maybe like well, once every two months or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there may be a like gap there. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, is there like a, a tag maybe that they could? sync up with to be to do those kind of regular check-ins or I think that's the thing that Laura said in the beginning that we're kind of confused by and we're trying to figure out is is that process right it's it's kind of like now we have we've heard this now right and now we know what we need to do but this took x amount of time and I know we know you ever talk is busy we understand that um as much as we might disagree, right? We still have to make sure that we're following the, the the talk process because we do want to graduate. We do feel that the adoption of this project is 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 making this thing like where it's it's a necessary project out there. So we will continue to do that. So I guess the question more is like, what what is the periodicity should we should do check-ins for this? And 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 what would you like to see to avoid being in this situation again? Is it specific to this, or is the is the is the goalpost going to change at a, a given point? So if we come back and we have we get we have more people contributing at the core level, or at the EBPF and all of those things, is there other things that we have to address? I can't speak for the whole TOC. I can only tell you what I the concerns that I have, um, and you know in. I mean, I, I would say maybe, you know, six months seems like a reasonable period of time for things to have. So, you know, if you came back and said, actually, yeah, look at this, you know, we've got the same group of maintainers, but now they're working for different organizations. So we kind of proved that multi-vendor thing and it's been stable for six months and, you know, an adoption still going up. That would feel, you know, more likely to, to kind of meet the criteria but you know equally in six months time who knows you know maybe i wouldn't be on the toc anymore maybe it'd be different i i can't guarantee to you that that there will you know the toc would agree at any particular time that you know because because it's always going to be a judgment call the criteria are you know we try to write down the criteria to the best that we can but it is a judgment call in the end of the day and we want it to be hard because we want the graduation to mean something, um, you know, for for end users. There's no denying the the adoption of NATS, GRPC, and Falco, and they'll continue to be adopted and used regardless of you know. Again, we really appreciate the you know the graduation kind of spec and all of that. It's awesome. We love to hear it, and and that's the thing. We just want to make sure that we understand what is necessary to get over there, so there isn't that. You know that agita in trying to promote a project. So let's let's figure that out, and we appreciate everyone giving their feedback here. I think where we have had historically concerns about projects, a lot of the time it's come down to this: if it isn't multi-vendor, multi-organization maintainers, you know, some projects demonstrate that very clearly. I mean, you know, Kubernetes is a fabulous example for that. Um, and where projects don't do that and different TOC members have historically had stronger or different feelings about how um, how crucial multiple vendors is, uh, how, um, we, we, we how, understand how it. we... Yeah, you know. we understand. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Liz. We definitely understand that we do have aspects of, of multi-vendors. And in terms of the, the maintainers aspect on the core side, it just seems like that seems to be the 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 reflect the inflection point at this point, maybe if I'm missing it right or wrong, but um that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that's from my perspective, yeah, that, that's fair. It's also trying to balance as a project uh, the future of the project because 
in a general way, uh, being parked for a very long time uh, uh, has the potential to, for, for example, disincentivize people from, from contributing or using the project and, uh, and essentially understanding what the rules are, because as you were saying, these rules by nature are, are subject to interpretation. So that makes it more complicated for us to, to just, you know, uh, uh, exactly uh, understand uh, what to do and how to do it. You know, we're committed to, to do whatever is required, but uh, clarity definitely helps us and minimizes uh, the potential damage that is done to the project. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where the damage comes from, but you know, because CNCF is still, you know, it's in incubation, which is a pretty big, you know, sign of confidence and um, and support. Yeah, to give you an example, there the, was a, a junior developer in the project uh, that uh, uh, started making contributions and wasn't uh, uh, sure if this was the right project to contribute for him uh, based on the uncertainty on, uh, uh, on the future uh, of, of Falco. Uh, and, and okay, so, so I'm going to turn that around to you and say, if there's a junior developer contributing to the project who isn't sure about the longevity of the project, it's reasonable for me to have like, okay, you know, is that ready to graduate, you know? <laughs> You know, the, the, the CNCF's role in this is not to provide the, the de-risking. The CNCF's role here is to support the project in incubation such that it can get to a place of de-risking. Yes, again, we're, we're committed to do whatever, uh, whatever uh, is, is, is good uh, for the project uh, uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to do it. Wonderful. Does anybody else, I mean, we, we're almost running up to the hour. Does anyone else have anything they want to um, say about Falco? I'm just wondering if there's anyone from SIG Security here, for example. Um, yeah, and I, I wish there was a way of being able to sort of articulate that saying that a project is not in my opinion ready for graduation is not it's not like a vote of you know i still have confidence in the project so i still think it's a good project <laughs> in terms of tag security um just one kind of note for the talk we've we're kind of almost the gold standard for for the uh, the vulnerability assessment aspects and those things that we have been done so like that, I've, I've been told from members of the tag security that like that's it's really been, was done well from that perspective. So I think their concerns in terms of, you know, the vulner, uh, vulnerability you know, that they've looked into were addressed as part of this initial process. So if you look in the PR that has that being addressed. So I, I think that should be less of a concern. Obviously, we'll we'll run into that as, as we go. But that's definitely something that we've as a security product, we want to ensure that we're addressing. And again, we, we, we appreciate the talk, uh, giving us the time to be able to speak about Falco because we both feel very strongly about it and we'll continue to feel strongly about it. About it. So we know it's a product people, uh, excuse me, it's a project people are using and people are contributing to and are adopting. Great, keep that up and CIC will want to graduate it. All right, so we definitely didn't have enough time to talk. We didn't even have time to touch in on the incubation. Actually, we've got like one minute uh okay so does anyone who's on the call any sponsors want to make any comments about how they're getting on with their incubation and due diligence um i Sullium's nearly done i will be bringing it for very soon one question on um virtual cubelet because i know that's been out there for a while and I think I still have, no, okay, Cheng's dropped the call, never mind. Um, no, I'm here. I'm oh, you are? Here. Okay, sorry, carry on. Yeah, I I mean, uh, uh, 
there's a there's a virtual Kublet uh, community meeting actually on Thursday in a couple of days. So I, I I don't know if anyone from that community is on this call, but I intend to at, uh, attend the uh, uh, virtual Kublet meeting and have a discussion about uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know it, it, the, the issue is really compliance. What what's the current situation? What we believe should be the uh, should be the right uh, a stance, uh, you know, at least I, I want the project to have a strong opinion of this, then, then I could bring it back to TOC to have a discussion, because, because right now we don't seem to know where we really are clearly and, and we also don't have a strong opinion. That was the question of um, compliance with like, what with, is a key with, with Yeah, with, with real Kublet, right. with the, with the non-virtual Kublet. You know, virtual Kubernetes has a lot of implementations, but uh, but but they're they're compliant in various different ways. So so it's it's very tricky because how 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 strongly do we hold compliance a anyway? So so I think we've talked enough. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, please right. you know feel free to reach out to me if any any virtual Kubernetes members are on this call, and, and maybe we can have a chat even before Thursday's meeting. All right. Wonderful. I hope that, I mean, I, I think talking about, well, I hope this is, this has uh, been a productive meeting. Um, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, yeah, see you next time. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers, yeah.